the spring of 1912, Alma Polson and her four children had left their home in Bjuv, Sweden, to join father and husband Niels in America. Like many in Bjuv, Niels had tried to scrape a living out of the local coal mine. Conditions were harsh, and when Niels joined a strike, he was blacklisted and forced to leave the country. Polson relatives, Ola Lindfeldt and Lars Inger Glad, live only a few miles from the Bjuv coal mine where Niels had labored as a young man. He had to bail out because otherwise he couldn't support his family and not being able to get in a job, so he went to America and with the purpose of bringing the family over afterwards. Niels moved to Chicago, where he made a good living as a trolley operator. After two years, he'd earned enough money to bring his family across on the Titanic. They never arrived. But now their living relatives have a chance to find out if the little boy recovered by the men of the Mackie Bennett is indeed their lost relative. He's two and a half years old, and up till the moment he died, somebody called him a name, somebody held him, talking to him, trying to comfort him uh, as, as, him. As, you know, mm -hmm. as the boat was going under. And then his body is found again without a name, so nobody knows who he is. When I called the relatives, Ola, and I said, Ola, do you want to go ahead with this? He said, the unknown child deserves to be known. But there's a problem. Neither Ola nor Lars Inger is related to Justa through a maternal line, so their DNA can't be used to help identify him. But with the help of Swedish genealogists, Ruffman tracks down another Paulson relative. Though Ola and Lars Inger have never met this family member, John Hyland is a maternal cousin to little Josta and can supply the key mitochondrial DNA. If there is a chance to clear up a mystery, it is important to get an answer. Even if it is a mistake and you are wrong, you will have it confirmed. In the cemetery in Halifax, there are 44 mysteries still waiting to be solved. 44 headstones without names. Ruffman continues searching the public archives. In one of the coroner's entries, he finds a detailed record that could help identify a third victim. Ah, oh, that was body 240. Male 24. Pipe, key, silver watch and chain, one pound, five shillings, five pence in purse. The watch bears the name of a shop in Brighton, England. This and the British currency in the young man's pocket inspire Ruffman to recheck the passenger lists. 23-year-old Charles Shorney of Sussex County, England is the closest match to the clues provided by the coroner's report. But for Ruffman, perhaps the most compelling reason for pursuing this particular candidate is that he has also found a photograph was taken by the coroners in Halifax before burial. Could body 240 and Charles Shorney be one and the same? Genealogical sleuthing leads Ruffman to Shorney's living relatives, Gillian Wilkinson, Hilary Sutton, and Imelda McQuillan, who are amazed to hear their uncle's body might actually be buried in Canada. I put the phone down and walked around in an absolute daze until I could ring Imelda and say, she rang me. Say, Guess what? <laughs> and I couldn't believe it because no. we thought, surely, if there'd been that many bodies recovered, one of our family over the years would have heard something. Yeah. We heard nothing about it. Though this part of the history is news to the family, they all know the story of their uncle's short life. We've grown up on the family history of Charlie and the Titanic. By 1912, Charles Shorney was already a man of the world. As a valet for a wealthy family, he traveled far beyond his home in rural Sussex. Now, he was moving to America. He really loved uh, being abroad. I'd say the new life beckoned quite strongly. Awaiting Shorney's arrival was Marguerite, his fiance, and an ambitious plan to launch one of the first taxicab companies in New York City. Charles left England with half her family silver to get him started. And don't forget that he changed his ticket from one ship to another. 
because this was the Titanic, this was the big one, this was the one that everyone was talking about. And I suppose he thought of it as, you know, I'll be able to tell my grandchildren that I came to America on the Titanic. Charles's relatives have always believed his body went down with the ship. Now, they may have a chance to pay their respects at a gravesite in Halifax. It would be a rounding off of the whole tragedy to know what happened, whether that ending was good or bad. You need a completion to a life. That would be a completion to a life. I think it makes Charlie more of a solid kind of person somehow. It makes him more real to me. He's always been yes. a kind of legend. But to actually have a grave that somebody was buried in, that's a person and that's one of our family and that's important, I think. Shawnee's relatives face a dilemma. None of them are descended from his maternal line. And unlike Yusta's family tree, there are no distant cousins to step into the mix with mitochondrial DNA. But the family is not without options. To confirm whether body 240 is their lost uncle, they turn to another grave. Charles Shorney's father, Austin Sr., is buried in a cemetery in Sussex, England. If Charles is indeed body 240, then nuclear DNA can be used to establish the relationship between father and son. It's a long shot, but the family decides to exhume Austin's body, hoping enough nuclear DNA will remain to provide a comparison. On a rainy spring day, the family gathers at the graveside for the exhumation. A Canadian forensic team working with Ryan Parr will handle the delicate process of recovering the remains. Twelve feet below ground level, they reach the wooden coffin holding the body of Charles Shorney's father. Austin was buried in 1932, but he is still remarkably well preserved. The scientists select his right femur for the DNA sample and then reinter the rest of the remains. I think my grandfather was a very dignified man. I don't think we would dare to have exhumed him. I, I really mean dare to have exhumed him unless we felt very strongly that he would have wanted to know. Catherine Jane Wallace, Yusta Leonard Paulson, Charles Joseph Shorney three victims of the Titanic. Our scientists will attempt to prove that they are buried in Halifax. If they succeed, three families can finally claim the loved ones who lost their lives on that fateful passage almost a century ago. On a sunny day in Southampton, England, the Titanic prepares to set sail. Final arrangements are being made for the ship's maiden voyage. She is the most luxurious ocean liner the world has ever known. First class passengers have paid the modern equivalent of roughly $80,000 to sleep under down quilts, smoke the finest cigars, and consume 11 course meals off fine bone china embossed with gold and the White Star logo. But the Titanic is far more than a cruise ship for the elite. Much of the White Star revenue derives from the hopes and dreams of hundreds of immigrants who believe the ship will carry them to a better life in the New World. Steerage accommodations are a far cry from first class, but still a step up from what most third class passengers would have been used to at home. Yes, indeed, you'd be in fairly crowded rooms on some occasions, but you did have running water, you had the opportunity to bathe. You weren't being treated like cattle on board the, uh, the Titanic, you were treated as a passenger. At 12.05 p.m., the Titanic set sail, laden with 2,228 passengers and crew number of people that could fit aboard four modern jumbo jets. Crowds line the docks cheering the momentous occasion. Time passes quickly as the ship steams towards New York, now just two days away. The night of April 14th begins innocently enough, 
The sea is calm, and the passengers are enjoying their journey. In their cozy cabin deep below deck, Alma Polson most likely tucks her children into bed early. Brother Paul, the two girls, Torberg and Stina, and little Eusta, just two years old. By 11 p.m., many of the passengers are either asleep or settling in for the evening. Few have any inkling that ice warnings coming in over the wireless have been repeatedly ignored. At 11.40 p.m., the Titanic collides with an iceberg. Earth in the forward part of the ship down near the waterline, the first to feel the impact are third-class male passengers. Alarmed by the rising water in the holes outside their cabins, steerage passengers like Charles Shorney and his bunkmates pull their possessions together and head for the boat deck. But most aboard the Titanic are unaware of the collision, which is largely absorbed by the enormous ship. A number of people felt it. But the fact of the matter was, it didn't uh, jolt the ship. There wasn't a huge uh, sort of collision that, uh, that you might have expected. Low down in the rear of the ship, Alma and her children may well be unaware that anything is amiss, until a steward finally knocks at their door almost an hour after the collision. It is now approaching 1 a.m. Alma was down in the bowels of the ship in third class, along with a good number of other Scandinavians and Europeans. And she would have had uh, her hands full it takes time for Alma to rouse and dress her four children. Like most immigrants in third class, she is probably reluctant to leave the cabin without all of their belongings. Several levels above, the crew has started offloading some of the guests. The first lifeboats were launched uh, before one o'clock, and they had in them exclusively first class passengers. First, there is little sense of urgency. It soon becomes clear there is no set plan to evacuate a ship that many believed was unsinkable. The problem was, the deeper you were in the ship, the less you knew about how to get up to the boat deck. You didn't really know where it was. There had been no lifeboat drills for the passengers. The impression that was given to someone like Alma was that they would be rescued in turn and that they were to simply wait until there were further instructions. Third class men in the bow of the ship are just a few levels down from the boat deck. Yet some survivors recall that stewards sent these men to the very rear of the Titanic on a pointless journey that took them far away from the rescue effort. Eventually, the men arrive where the women and children from steerage have already gathered for instructions from the crew. Instructions that would never come. There was no organized rescue of the third class women and children. Once the third class men were in the stern with those women, the authorities viewed it as too dangerous to try to extricate them from that crowd, and the fear there was that there would be anarchy. It is now almost 2.15 a.m. The Titanic suddenly plunges bow completely flooded. It's at that point when the people in the rear are now aware that the boat is in fact beginning to sink. August Benerstrom, another passenger from Sweden, is one of the few third-class men who will live to remember that night. For the first time, there was a feeling of panic. Husbands sought for their wives and children, friends for friends, families gathered together. Now hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of people, both the men and the women, rush up to the boat deck. They came up just at the time when the ship was about to break apart and to sink. And they were simply faced only with moments to go. For third-class matron Catherine Wallace, the end is also here. A first-class passenger who survived, Arthur Bouchon, had taken charge of loading lifeboat number six. Years later, he recalled in a letter to Joan's mother that Catherine passed up her one chance to escape. She was at the rail. The man was ready to put her in, and she said to him, I'm sorry, I have to get my papers from my cabin. And that was the last he saw of her. <laughs> 